Hello, friends, and welcome back to What's in Store with Carly and Chris, the show where we cover hot topics at the cross section of retail and real estate. I'm Carly Iacono, and I'm joined by my co host, Chris Ressa. Chris, amazing to see you. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Living life, doing great. No complaints. So, we have a really fantastic sort of summer recap for all of our listeners today. We're going to cover an update on the Bed Bath & Beyond lease auction bankruptcy. We're going to cover some new information on DTC and store and store concepts. So we've got a lot of good information and uh, we're happy everyone listening could join us today. Well, speaking of summer recaps, I, I saw you were bungee jumping off of skyscrapers. What was that all about? I mean, sort of, sort of, almost. <laughs> okay. I did this crazy experience called City Climb at Hudson Yards in Manhattan. It is okay. the tallest open air building ascent in the world. So how it works, you go, you get all harnessed up, hard hat, safety briefing. They give you a breathalyzer. Like it is no joke. All these questionnaires. And then you climb up the outside of Hudson Yards and hang over at 1200 feet in the air off of this like see-through platform, just hang over the edge of the building. And then you go back down. It was maybe insane, but so much fun. Highly recommend it. When you say go back down, are you going back down like scaling the side of the building? I wish they wouldn't okay. let me do that, to be honest. I was okay. like, I really felt like that was a missed opportunity, but no, you go back down a few stairs, They take you out of all your safety gear and whisk you down the high speed elevator. So that part is very unexciting. Okay. Got it. But they Was also it, do it at night. So if you want to go back, I'll go anyone listening, you want to go back, we'll do a real estate trip. It was, was it scarier night. going up or down? It was definitely scary going up because it was really, really windy. <coughs> um, the views are incredible, but there's just nothing around you. Um, and that is very, very high insanely high right That's at the really very high. top of the city nothing else even close to the same elevation when you're up there it's amazing wow. so good times good times that's how i uh kicked off my fourth of july which was great got it well cool good for you and i hope you are finding summer adventure as well good time with the family at the beach anything exciting planned in your world nothing like jumping off a building so all right Next month, you can come recap with us next month. You'll find something. Perfect. All right, let's jump into Bed Bath & Beyond and really not just Bed Bath & Beyond, but the overall benefits of retail bankruptcies. And we've touched on this in a few different episodes, but I'd love to kind of look at it from the landlord perspective, other retailers perspective, and of course, lenders as well. So why don't we start with the landlord? When you hear bankruptcy, the first thing, obviously, first reaction is, ah, but not in today's market. So being a landlord, what is your feeling on having a vacancy or a retail bankruptcy in one of your centers? Well, I think it all depends. The reality is there are some bankruptcies that are painful for the landlord, but there's some that are opportunities, right? I think when we go back in time to like, the whole Sears Kmart. I think if we look today and we looked at all the Kmart, vacant Kmarts that were, and then, you know, so many are leased today. I think we would say that the landlord community has brought such a more vibrant, well-trafficked retail offering to the market. So many of those are like, you know, we're, we're split up into multiple things like a, you know, call it a TJ Maxx, a Ross, a Five Below, an Ulta, and maybe a Chipotle with a, you know, Chipotle on the end. And that creates more economic output for the entire trade area. It created jobs. It made a more vibrant, trafficked, you know, community gathering place. So I think in general, right, in that scenario, that was like such long waited, like everyone was like waiting for this to happen. And, you know, at the time, you know, in some properties, you would probably say, well, would you rather have, you know, that retailer hanging on, Kmart hanging on, or would you like the opportunity to actually, you know, retenant that box? 
there's always a scenario where, you know, you, the tenant leaving might be above market rent. And if they leave, you're not going to be able to replace the rent. But I think in today's market, we saw with the Bed Bath, there's a lot of opportunities for landlords to get the space back earlier than they thought and either get a higher rent or maybe unlock a redevelopment or something even bigger. So what this is telling me is it's really a chance to re-examine the center, breathe new life. And like you said, it almost reminds me of term limits on politicians, right? After so many years, sometimes it's just time for a change and you need new energy um, in politics or, or in your shopping center. But the key here is exactly what you said, Chris. It's how your rent that you're replacing compares to market. If it's a really old lease. This is, could be a huge opportunity. If it was a really expensive build out for the tenant and in turn they gave you high rent and now you're stuck with above market rent, then it could be more of a challenge to replace that and maintain the NOI in the center. But I think overall with vacancy levels as low as they are and a lot of um, legacy retailers that are turning over, it, it seems to be a net positive for landlords. And I think you would agree, no? I, I think so. And I think the, the reality is the time that it really impacts the macro landscape of retail real estate is when there's a significant amount all at once. Right. So back in 08, 09, and you had like circuit linens and all these groups going and closing so many stores, but the world has changed a bit. So I, I, I'm a landlord of two bed, bath and beyond stores, but in, uh, I don't know, as recent as 2015, 16, I had double digit bed baths. And so I think one of the things that's happened that was that is more frequent today than in yesteryear is some of these retailers, when they start to get in trouble, they start pruning some of the stores out. And so I would argue that a lot of the bed bath and beyonds already have former Bed Baths, already have new tenants in them before Bed Bath even filed. You know, they, at one time they had, you know, so many stores. I think the amount of stores for sale at the bankruptcy was like 375 leases. I, you know, I don't know what, yeah. I, I don't know what it was, you know, in 2009, but I think they had a lot more stores. So even if a couple of retailers file, there's still, it's probably the last straw and it's still not this significant volume of supply coming to the market that, you know, disrupts the, the demand that's there today. And this is looked at as a good thing because of where we are with vacancy in the market too. As we've said in so many episodes, we are at historically low vacancy levels, actually the tightest market since 2005 when CBRE began tracking tenant vacancy. Yeah, so and and I, that I would, plays into right for sure. I, I would say, when we say it's a good thing, I would say there's a, a bankruptcy in general is not a good thing. People are losing jobs. There's a lot of you know, uh, there's a lot of legacy and nostalgia in Bed Bath and Beyond. It's a retailer I've loved for years. Mm -hmm. I think there's. I think what we're talking about is there are potential positive outcomes that could come from it. Right. Very fair. Good distinction. Very important. Agreed. Yeah. One side we don't look at as often is what this means for other retailers. So Bed Bath & Beyond had about 7 billion um, of sales in the last trailing 12 months. So tremendous number. Where is all of that volume going? You know, consumers aren't just going to stop buying the products that they used to buy at Bed Bath & Beyond. So Who's benefiting? And, you know, I think this is something that we don't really talk about when there is a, a larger bankruptcy, other tenants do do profit from this. So where do you see that market share being picked up? You know, it, it's a question I've been asking and I haven't seen a lot of headline news about. And I think, you know, I'm often taken back to Toys R Us. Toys R Us was, you know, when they filed, they were like number 265 on Fortune 500. It was pretty wild. They were they were really up there. And the and, and they had like 13 billion in, in retail sales. And so I, I was like, okay, they're gone. Like kids still want toys, at least mine do. Where is this right. toy business going? And 
we saw, I don't think there's like a clear answer even to that, but we saw Target and Walmart and Amazon pick up all these toy sales. And so I think, and if you go into like Target, like the toy section at Target is huge. Like I know, cause I'm there, it's pretty big. Like any type of toys you want, your kids want, they've got a lot of different variety and depth of selection, which I'm not sure they had pre Toys R Us, maybe they did, but it's, it's pretty wild. So I think you saw some of that. So I think my point is, I think some of the mass merchants are really good at picking up share. Right. Um, as a as a global cohort so you'll see that but i'm fascinated like you know the container store dormify partnership to me is really cool dormify is a cool story this uh, young woman and her mother couldn't really you know get the dorm when she was going to college set up how she wanted there was no retail offering they created an online business called dormify and the container store just partnered with them and there's going to be dormifies inside the container store which i think is really interesting because bed bath and beyond had such good they had a lot of niche businesses in this big business they were really good at bridal registry they were really good at baby registry they were really good at back to school for college and setting up the dorm they were they had a real big focus on this i don't know who's capturing that but the container store has gone right after it i think it's fascinating and uh, you know kudos to them and we'll see who else starts to try to pick up some stuff. I think Target does that right back to college, but Bed Bath & Beyond had such a unique presence when you went in the store, right? Their actual setup, you felt like you were there, you could pick all the pieces. So I'm wondering if some of the other mass merchandisers will try to capture, maybe that's exactly what Container Store is doing with Dormify, capture that feeling when you go in that you see the whole room put together and it's not just ordering individual products one-off like you might do on Amazon. Yeah. So that could be an, an opportunity. Um, and, then, and, like and, on an, and then on an individual store perspective, like we saw this with JCPenney and Kohl's, where like in an individual market, where maybe there's like a JCPenney and Kohl's, and that was like the two dominant apparel retailers. When JCPenney left that market, Kohl's did see a pickup in that specific trade area. Mm -hmm. And they probably didn't capture it all, but they captured a bunch. So I think in some areas you're going to, you know, the – the market share is going to get dispersed depending on who's in that local trade area. Right. It's going to be more regional yeah. conversation. The last thing I want to touch on before we move on to more details on the Bed Bath Lease auction is how lenders are viewing bankruptcies in today's market. So we're seeing a lot of loan covenants tighten up. Obviously, lending standards have changed tremendously in the last six months. Have you had any issues or have you seen any anything in the market where uh, there's a vacancy in a center and the lender says we're no longer comfortable with this loan, right? Maybe the coverage ratios aren't there and we're calling the loan or what is the lender perspective on retailer bankruptcies that you're seeing? I, I don't know that it's any different than it's historically been. Typically that's all spelled out in the loan docs. It's like what happens to a, a vacancy. So I'm not going to say that lenders aren't concerned about retailers going bankrupt, but they've typically hedged and mitigated themselves on the front side of the loan docs in the event of, of, you know, large vacancies happening. Okay. That's good to hear. So you don't think there would be less workouts or more workouts because lenders don't want properties back given the challenge in the capital markets. It's more just spelled out in the loan documents and then discussed or negotiated, let's say on an individual basis. I think it's, you know, the impacts to the capital markets are so robust that no one bankruptcy is like, you know, making market changes to what's happening. Okay. All right. Good to hear. Let's move on to your experience with the Bed Bath & Beyond lease auction, which is fascinating to me. So from what I was seeing, there were about 153 leases that just went up for auction and I think about 109 traded, right? Yes. Yeah, so they, what happens was, what happened was before the, the first auction was on a Monday and the Thursday before you had to submit what they called a qualified bid on Saturday. If you qualified, 
you could show up to the auction on Monday. And then that bid would stand if the, they wanted. Once you submitted a bid, you're locked in at that minimum. That would stand if there were no other bidders and they said, yes, we're going to take this. Um, go ahead. So, so who was there bidding, right? Was When were you in person? Did you mail in your bid personally? And then who else was around you? Other landlords, tenants? Give me an overview of the landscape. So on Saturday, you didn't know who was there. And then on Monday, you showed up. You had to have like whoever was going, they had to say they were going and they, you had to be on a list. You had to be someone who had a qualified bid. You had to be on a list. Then you walked through the doors. Um, and the landscape was a variety. It was landlords and other growing retailers who wanted to be there. I think those were the two biggest food groups at the lease auction. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then and there was four phases of bidding. So there was there was the first set of leases was leases that they received only bids from landlords. The second phase of uh, leases were bids they received only from retailers. And the third phase was uh, competitive multiple bids for one lease. And then the fourth phase was uh, the package deal that Burlington made. So I'm going to just break this down on a more elementary level for some of our listeners who aren't in this space day to day and correct me if I'm off in any part of this, Chris, but the auction is for the lease. And this has nothing to do with the real estate, nothing to do with the assets. This is just for the right to take over the remaining lease terms as they stand, right? So if there's eight years left in term and you really want that location and you're a competing retailer, you can come pay a premium to take over the remaining lease with all in place terms and kind of slide into the position, correct? Yeah, generally speaking, I would say that's correct. I'm not sure every piece of the legal way you said it was right, but generally speaking from- Conceptually business-wise. Yes. Right, right. So the fact that retailers are paying just to take over a lease instead of going to sign their own new lease somewhere else really also points to the tightness in some of these markets where these these transactions went down. I think it's amazing they would pay such a premium. Yeah, I, I, I was, I was pretty shocked by some of the premiums that were paid for some of the leases. Um, you know, in some of the places I was kind of sitting there going, you know, saying to my, the, my colleague next to me, I was like, we have to go and see if we can buy that center. I can't believe all these retailers are like competitively Fighting. bidding on a vacant space to be in the center. Is there right. no other shopping centers in the market? Is there, is there just exactly no vacancy? Point. What What's going on? Right. I read that, uh, was it Macy's paid $1.2 million to take over a lease in Winter Park, Florida? That yeah. blew me away. It's crazy. Yeah. So that, that I was watching that as it went down. That, wow. That, you know, and Macy's had a, a team there and like they were pretty sophisticated on how they were doing their bidding. And, right. you know, they were they were going back and forth with Michaels on that one. And, uh, and it ended up, uh, you know, it's like, in 25,000 increments from a hundred grand up, they went all the way up to 1.2. Wow. That had so, to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really wild to watch. Amazing. And what other retailers did you see competitive while you were there? Who else so, got really so, excited? So Burlington was there, Macy's, Michael's, Barnes, okay. uh, Haverty's was there, Ollie's was there, Scandinavian Design. Um, there was a significant amount of different retailers, you know, Scandinavian design, uh, PJ Superstore was there, uh, Scandinavian design and Haverty's, uh, you know, Raymore Flanagan was there. That kind of made sense for me because the, you know, the bed, bath, home use provision probably made sense. I think, and that's another thing, which I think is really telling. So for 153 bids, I think, I think, you know, some might think of, a, you know, that's less than 50% of the stores got bid on. Well, there's a couple of things. One, the, there are a lot of other stores where the retailer has decided their best path isn't to buy the lease in bankruptcy court, is to try to let that lease go back to the landlord and make a direct deal with the landlord okay. instead of taking over someone else's lease. You know, we have a center with five LOIs with a bed bath and no one bid on that lease. Hmm. 
But okay. here's why. But here's why. Because you're buying an asset. So the first thing that the lease needs to have is term. Right. So my lease has one year of term, one five year option. If very few leases are trading sub 10 years of term, right? That's the asset that the bankruptcy court is selling, right? That the debtors are selling is I have this right to this space for a period of time. So if you think about that on the space that I have, which has one year term, one five year option, if a landlord, I mean, if a retailer bought that and then in six years, they spent all the money to turn it into whatever their store was, there's finally starting to grow sales. And in six years, they had no options. I could just terminate them and get someone else in. So the first thing they need is terms. So there was a lot of lease, the, the amount of leases that were what I called sub $10 a foot and sub and, and more than 10 years of term was give or take a little north of a hundred. So I, I think, you know, when you're thinking about this in the market, like I would say that almost every like market lease with 10 years of term got like, it felt like it almost got a bid. Now that's obviously an aggressive statement, but the point is, you know, there was a lot of, you know, Bed Bath & Beyonds over the last few years where they were renewing the lease with the landlord and maybe it was a kick the can down the road, like a two year extension. Right. And so just, you know, we're not sure how we're doing, you know, I'm gonna, if you want me to renew for 10 years, I'm going to close. So they make a deal for two years, something like that. And the landlord and the retailer are kicking the can down. The road. So that lease being sold, it, 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 there's not a lot of buyers. Right. Because there's not a lot of long term value. And what yeah. do the options look like on a lot of these? I mean, is, let's say there is the two year term, but maybe there's 15 years of options. That's yeah, they're, they're all story. over the board. You could go to like okay. A&G's website and look at every lease that was for sale. OK. And it has the rent, the term, the location, the options. But the other thing, right, that I was mentioning is the use restrictions in a shopping center. So if the tenant's lease says, if Bed Bath & Beyond's lease said, you have to use the premises for X, Y, Z, well, that's what you were buying. If you were some use that couldn't use it for what was in Bed Bath's lease, and they didn't have the catch-all language that said for any retail purpose, well, then that's a tough putt for you to buy that lease. You're better okay. off waiting for that lease to go back to the landlord and making a direct deal. I would hope you would know all that on the front end if you were bidding, right? I'm sure all that documentation was shared. Uh, there's I a lot hope. of, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. And then, and then okay. yeah. Because restrictions are, uh, yeah. I mean, that would change the whole nature exactly. of, of the deal. Yeah, right. very, yeah. very interesting. What's your prediction for the leases that they brought to auction? So they thought there was enough value to go that route but they didn't trade. Is there going to be in the, a round two here? Yeah, I think round two is next week. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So give it another go for that subset. And then the That's ones the that were not brought to auction, do we think that these will be brought at a later date or the, the terms are just too short or just doesn't make sense? I'm not sure what the plan is for those. Okay. Yeah. Overall, very interesting experience yeah, a, and strategy. It was, a cool experience. it was a cool experience to see how it was all going down uh, for sure. In person. Do you think you'd go in person to another bankruptcy auction if given the opportunity? Yeah, I, 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 I think you have to be bidding. I don't think they just let anyone in the room. At least mm -hmm. this one, they didn't. And right. then if they have the option to make it virtual or in person, unless there's some, unless you're like, all right, I'm going to submit a bid for like 50 cents. And if they take it, great. If not, I don't care. If right. you're like really planning on competitive bidding, I would recommend that you go. There's a lot to be seen in the room and those who were virtual didn't get to see all that. So I think there's probably opportunity from being physically present. I love when you told me there were teams for some of these large retailers with computers running, you know, with their laptops with them running different oh, models as yeah. the bids changed and kind of yeah. huddled together. And uh, it sounds like a scene from a movie. So yeah, it was really pretty cool. Really cool. All right, let's move on to what's happening in the DTC world, direct to consumer. So there's been just some a few things we want to touch on. One, what the growth looks like and how physical retail is playing in, and then what segments of DTC have really surprised uh, us and not been covered as much in the media for the the pretty impressive growth. So. 
I'll kick it off with a, a stat that we both shared from KPMG, which estimates compound annual growth of 23% from 2019 to 2023 in direct to consumer sales. So compound annual growth of 23%. Um, that's the phenomenal, right? Astronomical numbers of the success of DTC brands. So what does that mean for us in physical retail? Direct-to-consumer used to be very often, right? Just online only. That's no longer the case. So how are you seeing the growth of DTC impact bricks and mortar? Yeah, I think direct-to-consumer has significantly grown. And I think most of them reach a point where they say, oh, we need physical stores too. And we've seen that from so many, and we still continue to see that. I think how people enter stores is different across the board, right? Like some might have a store in store, like Dormify. Some might have a pop-up. Some might be Warby and, you know, just open up normal physical stores. What I think is interesting with this explosion to me is we haven't seen a lot of this get into what I would consider the traditional open air suburban retail center, which is the majority of centers in America. And I think given a change in the workplace, meaning there's hybrid and people are home more and this move where people have moved out of cities into many places in America, I think you're going to start to see more and more like, you know, you know, some lifestyle brand in a traditional grocery anchored center that hasn't happened in scale yet, but stay tuned. I think that's going to happen. It could be fun to watch a trajectory from the, the store and store or the pop up or these just almost feels like testing, like dipping their toe in. Yeah. Concepts. How many of those in five years were like, oh, of course it's in every, you know, it's right next to the Starbucks and every suburban shopping center. Like, how is that? Oh, not always been the case, right? It becomes so commonplace. So that'll yeah. be a fun sort of growth pattern to watch. For now, sure. there's one one category when we were catching up that you mentioned, which blew my mind. And I'm going to let you cover it because you yeah, brought it up. I, I, yeah. Go ahead. So the jewelry has just been fascinating. Um, I had no idea there was so many new jewelers who were doing so well online and then opening physical stores. And then, you know, the net new number of physical jewelry stores it has is, you know, is a hundred and what is it, Carly? I don't have it for me. I think it was a net increase of 133, which was 70% increase 2019 to 2023. Yeah. Which is just, so, you know, people want to feel good about themselves. They're buying jewelry. And I think it's a fascinating category that, you know, doesn't get spoken about as much in retail because it's usually smaller spaces, specialty, um, but the fact that they there's like just about every category that went online and tried to do DTC through online is now going into other avenues, which might be physical stores, might be some wholesale, might be store and store. I think it's really, you know, made retail real estate stronger in the long haul, created more opportunities for new tenants that were never there. And some of these numbers really are a surprise, the growth numbers. You think, oh, maybe there's a local jeweler who opens a small store, but these are big brands that are betting heavily on bricks and mortar. And I think that's really the takeaway. Everything from Tiffany's, Kendra Scott, Blue Nile, like a, a wide range of pretty significant tenants are saying, we're changing our strategy and we need to be in these centers in some capacity. Yeah. So, really, really exciting. interesting. Yeah, for sure. Last thing we're going to touch on today is an update on store and store. And we've kind of, you know, skirted around this already, but what are you seeing be really successful and where do you think we go from here in store to store and store concept? I, I think there's clearly some, you know, store and store is clearly here to stay. I think it's an ancillary part of a lot of these retailers businesses, but it's certainly um, super interesting. You know, the, the numbers Coles is talking about, which by the way, I just, you know, Coles, what unbelievable execution they've had, right? They announced this partnership with, with uh, Sephora. Sephora. 
in yeah. 2020 and they've rolled out 850 that execution is pretty so fast because it's yeah. in their stores it's disrupting their stores and the the increase in the sales they've had and the year over year growth and the amount of new customers they have and the amount of new uh beauty segments that they've been you know able to get into the store has been really uncanny if you just go to cole's earnings and it talks about all these new things that have happened because of this and it's been so strong that now cole's is opening another couple hundred in stores that weren't originally identified for sephora so i think that's really interesting uh for both concepts sephora and cole's one thing i'd like to point out on that i think they did exceptionally well with the branding of sephora so I've seen store and store, let's let's say when Toys R Us opens up in Macy's, I don't think their in-store presence is the same or anything close to what Kohl's has executed. When you go to a Kohl's with a Sephora now, it's noted on the outside of the building. When you walk in, there's a full build out, almost an interior facade. I know that doesn't make sense, but an interior build out that makes it feel like you're walking into a Sephora. So they really put money into almost having a consistent Sephora experience that you forget you're inside of another store. So how retailers roll out store and store and how much money they put into these build outs to affect the consumer experience, I think will make a big difference on the success of these programs. Yeah, the CapEx was no doubt, I'm, I'm sure you can look it up in their earnings, but the CapEx just from the, you know, the eye test is significant compared to some things that I've seen out there for sure. And I think, you know, if there's a lack of space out there, you might continue to see some new store and store partnerships um, for people that, you know, really gain some market share that they might not otherwise get. Exactly. I did also see that Walmart was partnering with Claire's to do store and store. I think they've got about 360 store and store locations. And I'll be interested to see if it feels more like the Sephora Kohl's build out or if it's just a, a section that happens to have some Claire's branded products. So yeah, that's the difference be, for sure. Yeah, exactly. All right. We covered a lot of great stuff. I'm so glad we could do our summer retail recap today. Uh, to everyone listening, I hope you found this information valuable. As always, reach out to Chris or I if you'd like to talk retail real estate. Chris, amazing to see you and uh, looking forward to next month. You too. Take care, Carly. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.